<clears throat> so, talk to you today of is water. Water, the scariest issue I could think of that you just keep wanting to put out of your mind. You don't think about it. So could we spend a few minutes talking about the issue? Just a general, what's going on? Why is it the crisis it is? Well, first of all, we shouldn't put water out of our mind. In, in fact, what do the st statistics say? You can last, what, three weeks without food? Then maybe three days, perhaps, without water. And you, without air, I think you'll last maybe three minutes at the most. Air and water are very important, but certainly water is super important. And I live without music. I've got music on in the background right now. So, anyway, so water, uh, as far as for granted, uh, still is being taken for granted, is still not getting enough uh, funding, whether it's private or public, to uh, make sure our infrastructure is capable of, of working, of transporting water and wastewater without crumbling and uh, deteriorating to disrepair and uh, the U.S. itself in the U.S. U.S. there's probably $500 billion worth of needs just for domestic, you know, uh, water, not even counting wastewater uh, resources. So it's a, it's a major, major uh, consideration right now. So we're seeing more and more uh, public, private, Financing coming through uh, uh, P3s uh, starting to come about for larger, uh, both commercial and uh, municipal. I was researching before our call, water only became part of our mindset in the 1700s when England was becoming industrialized and everyone was moving into the same area, and all of a sudden it had to be figured out. And it's only been since the 1900s that we've had these, these um, drinking water considerations and uh, all the water facilities. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the 1700s. Uh, here in the United States, and uh, was it 1783, George Washington came up to this part of the world that I'm talking to you from today, uh, Saratoga County, New York. And, actually went to High Rock Spring with Governor then Clinton of New York and uh, Alexander Hamilton, and they enjoyed the spring water there quite a bit. George Washington made a bid to buy Saratoga Springs back then. However, he was uh, blocked. People still come to this area th these days for uh, commercial purposes because of the abundant waters up here. So you'll, you'll see uh, enterprises like uh, Global Foundries, the massive uh, chip fabs uh, they're building in Saratoga County now as a result of having an abundance of water in upstate New York. However, that's not the case um, in other parts of the country and certainly the world. And it's drinkable water. That's the key. It's drinkable water and, of course, the uh, for commercial, for the fabs, that, that's used for process for the chip you know, chip fabrication. And you used to see these types of fabs a lot in the Southwest, in Arizona and Texas, but we're seeing a migration now and it's not, they're not coming here for the weather. They're coming here for the water. It's like Humphrey Bogart in the Casablanca, you know, what is it? Louis asked him, you know, Rick the bartender, you know, why, why did you come here? And I came here for my health. I came here for the water. Louis says, it's a desert. Rick says, I was misinformed. <laughs> Classic line. But it, and, but it makes you think about water and why people do uh, migrate to certain places and whether it's an oasis in the desert or whether it's the uh, seashore for recreation. Water is, is a ma major attractor in this world.
but what were because of limited drinking water a limited amount as a result over the next few years territory lines for nations could change wars could break out yeah we, we we've heard many times the next great war will be fought over water and that's been a a theme for many years now, uh, whether it was the ultra violence in the in Jack Nicholson's film Chinatown, uh, you know that was all about the water in Los Angeles and who controlled the water in this developing metropolis. Uh, there's a James Bond movie about w uh, water rights in South America. Basically, uh, you know, they're, they're, we're, this is a global, uh, you know, certainly a global issue, and it's not just drinking. It's you know, it's it, it, water is key and the fact is you know a good percentage of the world's population does not have clean drinking water i think it's close to a billion people do not have access i, I think yeah. so you're going to all these international conferences regarding water you're covering it you're writing writing about it so if we were to say there are two or three things that architects and owners and developers are most fascinated by, really focused on for the topic, what are they? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, it was interesting that this is not just a big city issue. This is a small town issue also. So if you're a commercial developer, say, in Arkansas, uh, and I'm thinking of a community called Southside right now, and they were dealing with failing septic tanks for many years that that really contracted uh, possibility of commercial development uh, going on when they converted from septic to sewer that enabled economic growth for the for this uh, town of Southside and we're seeing that replicated ar around the world so that's a that's a major concern having the water wastewater infrastructure will enable uh, a commercial enterprise to, to operate effic efficaciously, definitely. Yeah, wastewater is the key. A lot of people aren't talking about it, but when you go deeper on wastewater, how it's handled, why it's so. Like, like I mentioned, Dean, in the last uh, comment, Southside Arkansas is a small town and it was, you know, fairly. Uh, sparse at one time and not so dense so they when, when they built out they just put in septic tanks or on schools building and eventually these these cesspools the septic tanks fail and uh it pollutes the groundwater it creates a health hazard uh, it does not enable further development that you know that's a crucial aspect that's repeated around the country and in residential as well as commercial but we're seeing commercial right now if, if you're talking about development any anywhere west of the mississippi um, water or lack thereof and then clean water even i was out in new mexico uh, a week ago uh, outside uh, in albuquerque and uh, just outside of albuquerque there's a community called bosque farms and uh, the community of peralta and you think you think of New Mexico as arid desert, but they've got a water table there that's just four feet down, and that area is governed not only by tribal rules for water, but rules that were set down during the the Spanish possession of the territory, as well as state and federal rules. So to figure all of these rules out and then provide the water infrastructure, water wastewater infrastructure that's needed to preserve the water resources is, is a major issue. And you're gonna find that more and more as you get certainly into larger cities, uh, if you wanna do a commercial development. I think LA County is one of the toughest, it's renowned as being one of the toughest in the country. And uh, the last large project there had to go through like 221 environmental uh, before they could finish entitlement. So we're talking a lot about local and the impact. So I'm an architect, I'm designing a major office building in a second, third tier city. What are considerations regarding water that I have to have now that I wouldn't have thought about even 10 years ago? Well, Dean, 
I like to say some of my best friends are architects, but the, the fact is a lot of architect, architects you talk to, even my best friends will say, hey, talk to our engineer about this. Uh, yeah, they want to keep their hands clean, especially as far as wastewater is concerned. And I understand that, but we're seeing more and more architects now, um, whether they're landscape architects or commercial architects that have to figure out how to put a building in, how to get the, how to work with the density uh, uh, that's provided by the developer. So that the developer maximum density out of this parcel. And if you don't have the correct water infrastructure to serve that density, then you're going to be losing, you're going to be wasting lots. You're going to be wasting space, whether it's commercial, multifamily, you know, uh, residential, and uh, particularly in some parts of the world, real estate is at quite a premium right now. So we're, we're seeing projects where if they, the right water infrastructure, they can include three or four more lots or parcels that would not have been able to be otherwise because they couldn't be sewered, for instance. So that becomes a massive economic driver for decision making. This week I was involved in a conversation and it was the owner and also the architect, and we we're talking about capturing rainwater and that they're redoing their building to capture it. What really is the benefit of that? Well, it's certainly uh, depending on the part of the world you're in. You know, if you're in a if you're in an arid area, you, everybody's got cisterns. Go to Bermuda, for instance. Everybody collects every house, every building. The rooftop is, uh, you know, a water collector for for when it does rain, and they fill up those cisterns. That's just the way of life, and, and it has been for many many years. Uh, yeah, if you go to the Green Build Conference, you'll see some pretty interesting, uh, you know, rain reclam uh, rain collection systems there, I, and that's coming up, I guess, in Atlanta. Uh, yeah, the, middle of the month here of November. Weeks, yeah. yeah. So you'll you'll see a, you'll see uh, a certain number of companies uh, addressing that. Now it's tough. It's a tough industry. It's very fragmented because. These large cisterns, you know, are usually locally sourced because it's just too expensive to ship air, so to speak, or these giant tanks around the country. So you don't see large manufacturers talking about it, but it is a local issue, and there are local providers. Good. You know, this is just an overview about what you're going to be hitting on in the future, and all different content. You're using. Yeah. What are Let's just to, to wrap this up. What are some of the things that the audience would be really curious about that you're going to hit on later? One concern is certainly the rules I was talking about before. What are the requirements for for appropriate infrastructure in a new commercial environment? Uh, you know, what are the main drivers or decisions that have to be studied before they go into uh, an area. You know, say there's a beautiful piece of land and perfect for, say, um, a shopping environment. Mixed use with re residential also. However, there's no way to sewer it. Does that land go wasted? Does that look over? And I think I can provide a lot of information about how to meet challenging uh, land, meet challenging rules, and meet challenge and meet the challenges of financing these projects also. So it, it's it's about putting people, ideas, and money together in a very collaborative sense. And we're seeing as far as project delivery, that's evolving also. And we're we're seeing more and more. Uh, projects delivered, not just uh, design build, but more uh, construction manager at risk CMARP type projects, as well as these P3s. So hopefully I can provide some more insight in, into that changing landscape, because that that can be a little bit confusing, if not uh, <laughs> mysterious, uh, you know, to, to uh, somebody just getting into 
to that market. Great. Thanks for doing this for Comarc. It's my pleasure. I'm very excited about this mission that you're on, and uh, you've assembled such a great team. And uh, you know, glad to be a part of it.